They built the cabins, trails, and roads of Shenandoah National Park, and they built better futures for themselves. On this edition of Living in Virginia, the men of the Civilian Conservation Corps shared their stories. And it gave me the desire to give anyone I work for my best. The greatest thing that ever happened to me. How the CCC boys shook off the blues of the Great Depression on this edition of Living in Virginia. It's hard to imagine any place on earth as peaceful as Shenandoah National Park on a cool winter day. Only the occasional breeze through the trees breaks the stillness of the frozen air. Yet this calmness stands in stark contrast to the park's genesis some 60 years ago. From 1933 to 1942, these mountaintops were abuzz with the activity of thousands of young men. Collectively, they provided the muscle for one of the strongest government programs ever established in the United States, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And nowhere would this strength be displayed more than at Shenandoah National Park. The most dramatic thing, I think, for visitors of Shenandoah as they drive down Skyline Drive today is that they think they're driving down a road through a vast wilderness. Uh, and yet, in reality, there's probably nothing you see close to the drive that was now created by the Civilian Conservation Corps. I mean, in 1934 and 1935, those slopes were bare of vegetation. CCC dug up or transplanted or grew over 100,000 trees and shrubs that were planted the length of Skyline Drive. I mean, that's an average of 1,000 trees per mile. No one today realizes that what they are seeing is a made landscape. I mean, it's essentially a big garden that was created by the Civilian Conservation Corps. But to fully appreciate the impact of the Civilian Conservation Corps, one must have an understanding of the state of the country before the CCCs and the newly elected president who pondered how to refire the engine of a stalled American economy. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office, America was at the height of the Great Depression. The, Amer the average American income for those lucky enough to have jobs was down by 50 percent. 25 percent of the American workforce had no jobs at all, and over 30 million of their dependents had no incomes at all. Three weeks before he was inaugurated, Roosevelt called together his designated secretaries of war, interior, and departments of labor and asked them to pull together legislation to establish a civilian conservation corps. Only 27 days after Roosevelt took office, legislation was passed for what would become the Civilian Conservation Corps. With the president's hasty signature, an immediate call went out for thousands of young men age 18 to 25. They'd be sent to work at national parks and forests throughout the country. They'd see a numerous tasks designed to improve public areas, but they would see little of the money they earned. They were paid $30 a month uh, at the lowest grade within the CCC, 25 of which was automatically deducted from their pay and sent to their parents at home to support the families. Considering that the average blue-collar worker in 1933-1934 was making about $17 a week if they were lucky enough to have a job. That $25 a month went a long way to supporting the family at home. I was a messenger in the Welfare Bureau and uh, there was 10 boys that come in the office one morning and I didn't know what they were. They were, they were going in the signing up for the CCC. Well there was 10 signed up one didn't show up, so I feel that spot that the one didn't show up. I uh, used to help a fellow on a milk truck, Greenleaf Dairy, and we used to serve CC camps. And I think that's where I got indoctrinated into what it was all about. And being a person that uh, kind of wanted to be part of everything, I went ahead and joined. Well, you said, you know, and spread around, and we, I find out that another boy, miles or two away, he got into camp like that, you know, and, and I was just anxious to get in myself. And, uh, and uh, when I got 17, I thought I could fool him enough. 
and enough of them were fooled. Eventually, the age for admittance into the CCCs was lowered, but the deception continued. I was 16 and up my age to 17 by falsifying the, the deal. Quite frankly, a lot of the boys lied. We have several veterans of the CCC in Shenandoah, one whom enlisted at 14 years of age. Uh, lied through the teeth of the recruiter. Uh, when he arrived in camp at Shenandoah, the camp superintendent didn't think he was 18 years old and thought he might have been 16 or 17, but in reality the boy was 14 years old. But age was only one of the ways in which the recruits were diverse. Some came from big cities, others were fresh off the rural farms, but all had one thing in common. They were boarding trains they hoped would take them to a brighter future. We left down on a train, I guess it had about 12 coaches, and they just dropped coaches off here and yonder and here and yonder, you know. Got on a train and come up to Luray. They put us in the back of a truck, an army truck. <laughs> and I realized that he was going just like this over the road, coming over to Stanley. And we took that Red Gate Road up to the mountain up, and it was this way. And I thought to myself, we were going out of this world. But uh, we were all laughing about it. Wonder where he's going. Now. He's turning this left now. Our ears stopped up, and the snow was whipping in on the back of the truck. I laughed anyway. We had a good time. The ten of us really got acquainted. Told us Camp Roosevelt. I remember the army sergeant telling us Camp Roosevelt. He said the Garden of Eating. Yeah, and I remember, remember that. This garden was actually the George Washington National Forest, soon to become Shenandoah National Park. Its proximity to Washington ensured that it would become a focal point of President Roosevelt's New Deal. Skyline and Big Meadows were the first two Civilian Conservation Corps camps in the Park Service. The planning, they were established the 15th of May, 1933. This is less than three months after Roosevelt's inauguration. There was not a lot of time to plan this program, but Roosevelt wanted it started to bring hope to the, to the country. Inspiring his forest army by a personal visit, President Roosevelt makes his first tour of the Civilian Conservation Corps camps in the Shenandoah Valley. Roosevelt was here at Big Meadows in the Skyland in August of 33, five months after the camps were established. He was followed by all the big newsreel companies, and this big national coverage of Civilian Conservation Corps camps went out. This really lifted the morale of the country, and this is why Shenandoah really was the model for the Civilian Conservation Corps. It's very good to be here at these Virginia CCC camps. I wish I could see them all over the country. I hope that all over the country they're in as fine condition as the camps that I've seen today. There were 10 camps in Shenandoah over the course of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Over 6,500 boys went through Shenandoah and helped to create this park. There is no other park that had the CCC participation that Shenandoah did. You had two types of boys, if you can generalize. Rural boys, and they did work on the farms. Urban boys and boys from industrial areas. They were perhaps the hardest hit. Uh, when you're on the farm, there's never a lack of work to do. You're not hanging out on street corners. Uh, if you came from a coal mining town in western Pennsylvania and your parents were out of work, there wasn't much else to do. The average high school education in the CCC na nationally was an eighth grade education. See, most of the people that went in there had dropped out of school and um, they were just allowed to roam the streets, which is bad, that gets you in a heap of trouble. There are other recorded cases that the CCC boys have, have uh, documented in oral history interviews where the local police chief, if he knew a boy was having problems because his parents were out of work and he was on the streets too much, the local police chief would take the boys to the recruiter and suggest very strongly that they enlist in the CCC. Yeah. But whatever their backgrounds, one thing was certain, they were embarking on a new lifestyle unlike any they had known before. Well, the regimentation of the camps was strictly military. The boys were wakened with a bugle call at 6 o'clock in the morning. They assembled at the flagpole 
in the center of, of the camp. They had a flag raising. They checked to make sure everybody was there that was supposed to be there. Marched into breakfast. And they'd go back and have about a half an hour to clean the barracks, make up their beds. And there were routine inspections, just like in the military. And if you didn't have your bed made correctly, you went on KP. Then they would be trucked to the field, at which point Park Service would take over supervision. About 3.30 to 4 o'clock, they were trucked back to camp. They'd be given about a half hour free time to clean up. Then they had to dress, uh, change clothes to dress uniforms. They would once again march to the flagpole, have a ceremony called retreat in which they'd lower the flag and at that point the workday was officially over. They'd go into meals, then after meals there would be two to three hours of free time. Uh, there'd be blinking lights at quarter after nine at night letting you know at 9.30 was lights out and you were asleep. I mean, it, it was a very regimented day. The farm boys would be used to that schedule. The urban boys would not. Uh, some boys never, the, never accepted it. There, there's a downside of the CCC story that there was about an 8% desertion rate uh, through the course of the CCC. Uh, some camps, uh, it was up to 20% in the last years of the CCC. And primarily with the more urban boys who were just not used to the regimentation and were not used to those hours. In addition to acclimating themselves to their daily regimens, the CCC boys often found there were still more surprises to be discovered. I signed up to be a cook, and they gave me a shovel. Well, when boys first came into the camp, they'd usually meet with the camp superintendent, and he would ask them their interest, what their backgrounds were. If there wasn't the skill available, they were volunteered uh, by someone else. So it happened to be a kid in the group that came in with me from Norfolk, and uh, he told the leader that I could drive, that I'd been driving. And uh, so the leader asked me to move the truck over to where they could unload it. And I moved it out over there and got out and got my shovel. And the leader took my shovel away from me. He said, you, you don't need that anymore. You're a truck driver. I did different things, worked, helped build the road. It was things to do, shoot stumps, I helped, helped dy dy uh, dynamite stumps there. Well, the division of responsibility in the camps was always controversial. The, the Department of War ran the actual camps during the day. These were either active or reserve military officers. They ran the day-to-day -day schedules. The projects, the design of the projects and the supervision of projects away from camp was supervised by the National Park Service. So there was always this friction between the Army and the National Park Service. Arthur Emery remembers being caught in the crossfire of this battle when he was granted leave by his Park Service superintendent. So he gave me a pass for a week to take to Lieutenant Curtis. So Lieutenant Curtis wants to know when I made up all that time. I said, you ask Mr. Noyes, he keeps the records. So he called up Mr. Noyes. Mr. Noyes said, you run the army, I run this part. <laughs> Emery also recalls one particularly harsh winter morning. We had snow up to the half sash of the windows. And I decided one morning I wasn't going to go to Reveille. <laughs> so I stayed in my bunk. And four guys took my bunk out and set me in line. <laughs> with, and then Lieutenant Curtis, you know, the sergeant says, six men absent, uh, so many men present, one man in bed. <laughs> so Lieutenant Curtis says, we'll have to check his story. He comes over and yanks the cover off my face and there's no one then. He said, uh, just what your, what's your story? I said, Lieutenant, I don't have a story. You don't have a story? I said, no, sir. I worked last night. Ha, ha, ha. He worked last night. And uh, he said, we'll have to check his, in other words, check with the boss. So he made those guys take me back in the barracks. And they lifted me up as high as they could and dropped me on the floor. And it really hurt my back. So I told the shop foreman what I had done. He said, that's all right, I'll take care of it. So 
So Lieutenant Curtis comes up left after a while and wants to know where that Emory boy worked last night. So the guy pointed to different vehicles. So he did this job, he did that job, did the three or four jobs. Damn, got me again. <laughs> Life was not all work and no play for the men of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Even CCC boys will be boys. Skyland and Big Meadows built gymnasiums. Uh, the gymnasiums were built by the boys on their own time. The Army would not allow them to, to work on a recreation program supervised by the Department of Labor on government time. So they did it on their own time. There was fierce athletic competition between the park's ten camps. Rivalries arose, and with them came new forms of recruiting local boys in towns such as Shenandoah. You know, they had a work superintendent that did the work. He was a great baseball fan. So, uh, I don't know how this fellow got word, I mean, my friend got word that the superintendent would like to have some ball players. So he come to me and asked me if I'd be interested in CCs to play ball, he says. I told him, yeah, I wasn't doing anything. So that's how I got in through my being a ball player. And uh, there was, uh, I believe, four of us from Shenandoah went at that time, and all of us were ball players. The superintendent was allowed to pick so many local people, what they call local woodsmen. Well, I didn't know one wood from another, but I knew baseball. <laughs> and that's really what he was looking for. So we got in as local woodsmen. We traveled from camp to camp. They had a regular leg and uh, games to schedule with each other. Some were played in other camps, and some in our, we had a baseball field and everything. And we had one of the finest ball teams that was on the drive, named the best ball diamond in Big Meadow. We got the clay out of the copper mines down in Dark Hollow and uh, our diamond was beautiful in the infield. But recreational activities weren't limited just to athletics. Skyland Camp had a radio station, uh, and that was extremely popular. They had a glider club. They had woodworking classes. The most popular programs were the trade-related programs, auto mechanics. Uh, many, many, many of the CC boys learned the trades that would become their future careers in the CCC. The training from the CC helped me adjust to all the other endeavors that I got involved in. I went to work for the Navy as a machinist helper. So that I had learned some uh, in the garage up here. I was going to school at nights and I was taking typewriting. So I was pretty good typist. In fact, everybody wanted me to type their letters home to their, I, I did it. Um, I'd either charge them a bag of Bull Durham tobacco or Hoover dust, we'd call it. Or I'd say, you owe me a favor for doing this. Uh, some guy had an iron to iron your uniform, your shirt, you know. I had them iron my shirts for typing a letter for them. A lot of the boys had side businesses, if you will. Some of the boys made extra money teaching other boys to play the guitar. Some of the boys took on barracks duties for other boys for money. Uh, one of the boys we know that we did an oral history interview with was paid two dollars a month by all the other boys in his barracks because he'd get up in the morning and light the wood stoves early in the morning so that they didn't have to get up and they'd wake up to a nice warm barracks. So a lot of them had hustles going uh, to make money. I mean, there was gambling. Oh yeah, yeah. Wasn't a lot of money involved in it because nobody had any money. <laughs> but every penny earned could be a penny spent on a weekend trip off the mountain. I think most of the fellas went just to get away from camp. I, <laughs> that was the main thing. <laughs> The boys here at Skyland and Big Meadows usually went in Luray Friday and Saturday nights. They'd go to pool halls, they'd get ice cream, they'd go to the movie theater. 
Same thing really happened in Harrisonburg and, and in Front Royal, but I mean, they had really three main interests when they went into town on the weekends, and they were girls, girls, and girls. We had these places that we hung out at, and uh, usually a restaurant or a beer place, and some of us picked up a girl a year in there. And, well, I like my beer too, so most of my money went for my beer. Like many of his friends, Whitey Groves married a girl he met during his time in the CCCs. He recalls risking life and limb in the name of love. And I'd go down there and more or less spend this Saturday night. I'd come back to camp and the truck would pick me up, bring me back to camp every Saturday and Sunday night. Then it got so I'd go down on weeknights and I'd walk off the mountain and come back up the mountain at nighttime, but uh, I had to, it was so dark sometimes coming back up the mountain, it, I was alarmed that maybe a bear or bobcat or something would get after me, but I was in love, boy, so I didn't give a damn, excuse me. <laughs> the future was getting brighter for the boys who left the CCCs and married. As the decade drew to a close, America's economy was growing stronger. As the program moved on and it became more and more difficult to recruit, and every, every recruiter had a quota. I mean, you will hire 100 boys this month. Well, as it got into 20, 37 and 38, jobs were becoming more plentiful. Boys did not need that work. Some of the recruiters, um, as the military recruiters have been uh, criticized for, made up uh, made up a lot of stories about how great this life was. I mean, some of the boys from Pennsylvania came down thinking they were going to a resort in the mountains. Well, all at once they get here, and sorry, this is no resort. This is hard work. Once in a while, you'd get a new recruit in, and the guys would tell snake stories or something, <laughs> and the poor things would be scared to death. <laughs> and some, some guy would take a set of rattlers and crawl around on the floor <laughs> and shake the rattlers near the kid's head. Of course, he's gone out of the window at that time. But a more serious problem was about to strike at the heels of the CCC. The irony of the Civilian Conservation Corps was that it was the most popular Roosevelt New Deal program. And as the New Deal pulled America out of the Depression by 36, 37, it became increasingly difficult to meet the quota for CCC boys. They didn't, need the, they didn't need the income. So in a way, the success of the New Deal caused the death as a civilian conservation corps. World War II was really the final blow. The economy was thriving as we moved into World War II, and the program ended uh, in June of 42 because America was at war. The program was actually, the program is still authorized. The program was never deauthorized. Congress just failed to refund it. So someday should Congress choose to fund the Civilian Conservation Corps, it still exists in law. And the spirit of the CCC still exists in Frankie Barlow. His father was a construction worker in the Corps. Now Frankie is a carpenter for Shenandoah National Park. He often works on structures built by the CCC. You can really tell they were um, put together good. It was heavy duty constructed, really. <laughs> yeah, makes you think when you um, doing something that you um, go a little bit extra and make it last as long as what it has last before, you know, put a little bit more effort into it. When you know men worked on it, you know, 60 some years ago. For years, Frankie has accompanied his father at the annual CCC reunions. He won't have the opportunity this year, however. Russell Barlow died a few months after this 1998 reunion. The reunions are very emotional events for all of us that are involved in them. Every year there are less of the boys back uh, and yet they mean so much to them. This park means so much to them. For many of the boys and they say it over and over and over again, the Civilian Conservation Corps was the defining moment of their life. The greatest thing that ever happened to me. Best move I ever made in my life. And that was a good experience. I, I learned a whole lot. Well, I was like any other boy at 16. Uh, 
I had a floating mind that was into everything, uh, I guess good, bad, and indifferent, but uh, it settled me down and I just got a different outlook on life, I guess. Uh, I don't know what the feeling that comes over me. You might say I was one prior to coming into CCCs that um, I wanted to get by with just as little of work as I could get by with. But when I got up here and realized that I had to work or be discharged, I made up my mind I'm going to work just as hard as that man wants me to work. And I did. And it gave me the desire to give anyone I worked for my best and my life started then. The product of the labor of the men of the Civilian Conservation Corps who have opened up the Shenandoah National Park and other parks to the use and the enjoyment of our citizens. That product is as significant as though instead of working for the government, they had been working in a mill or in a factory. It's going to be a busy and a useful place in the years to come, just as the work of these young men will, I am very confident, lead them to busy and useful lives in the years to come.